we are the current research group here, and we are going to talk about the curling, which will be funny. Let's change the my resolution. So probably most of you know what curling is, but for some of you who don't, I'll just very briefly introduce it. So it's an Olympic sport, very popular here and at some other northern parts of the world. It's played on ice, which looks like this. Two teams of four players start on one side and they are sliding rocks to the other side and they are trying to get their rocks close to the middle of this circles, which are called, called the house. Uh, if you have never, there are 16 rocks, so each team is sliding eight of them, and they are alternating their shots. If you have never seen anything like that, then I have a very short video of one shot, so this is the situation somewhere during the game. Uh, this is the, the red uh, stones are, are for one team, the yellow stones are, are for the other team, and now uh, there is another uh, I don't remember which one, probably red stone going on. Currently, the closest rock is this yellow rock, so it means that if nothing changes, yellow would get one point. No, two points, because of this is one point, this is the second point, and third rock in the order is the red one, so that's why it's two points for, for yellow. So they agree on what they want to do, and then one from the team slides the rock, the others sweep, to correct for, for the mistake, so they can try to make it go a little faster or, or, or a little slower, thanks to that. And then all, all rock stops, and this is a new position, and the second team would, would play. In this position now, it was a good, good shot, so now red is uh, getting one point, because the first rock is, is red, the second rock is, is yellow. So it's one point for red. Right, so this is curling. Uh, there are in Olympic curling, there are 10 rounds in which they, they shoot these, these uh, 16 rocks, and the rounds are called ants, which like you know, people use later. So why do we care about curling? Um, mainly because we believe that AI can help analyzing this sport. And then we have like two angles from which we, we look at the problem, and that's the application perspective and AI research perspective. So in the application perspective, we, have, we think that AI can help people understand the sport better. So, if we are able for a specific state to compute the game theoretic value of that state, like what is the probability that, that the team will win given this state and knowing nothing else, and if everybody is play, playing perfectly, then we can just add this number to, to the stream and, and, a, and a viewer who is not really familiar with the sport can, can come and see immediately that, uh, okay, now Sweden has 58% probability of winning and now if they do a show, they mess up something, and it goes down. They know that this was probably a really important moment in the game, and the announcers can talk about that, like what, what happened, how it relates to this this win probability number, and it can make the, the sport more enjoyable. Yeah? Do this exist now? No. Currently, there is almost almost no analytics. They have no idea. Like there are smart people, probably so further curlers. Okay, so but they give the probabilities, but it's not. No, they, they don't give anything. This is this is <laughs> Photoshop. Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. This is, a this is what we would like to do. Yeah. This is for winning this end or winning the whole game? Uh, in our case, for winning the whole game. And then you can you can make polls like this, which are, you, here you have like time, how, how the ends progress, so you can have it within the end, or you can have it between the ends. So at any point in the game, you can say what is the probability that they will win the whole game. Next thing we can do with, the, with AI is to collect more objective statistics for, for players' performance. So currently, what they do is the only meaning, meaningful statistics that, that is uh, collected for, for the players is so-called curling percentage, and it works in a very subjective uh, manner where there is a, a judge uh, standing next to the ice. He's trying to guess what the team wanted to do, then he looks at what they actually did, and try, tries to create it as a school, like was this an A school, A shot or a B shot, and, and that's the only statistics. And, and these statistics don't really say much about how the game went, right? Here we can see that in total the, the team curled 84% and, and this team curled 81%. You don't really know like who won or, or why is that important. Actually in this game Sweden won. 
So, so the theme with lower percentage was, and using the AI techniques, we can actually be much, much more objective. We can tell apart what was just luck, what was a really good shot to, to, to be called, and if we just count differences in the win, win probability percentage, that would be a much better measure that, that would add much to, to the score. Currently, that is done real time, too. Uh, this current percentage? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are done, done real time. We, we aim for, for real time as well. Uh, the last thing we, from the application perspective we want to do is to improve team strategy. So first of all, we can use the, the curling simulator to train people better. Because people say that it takes 10,000 hours to, to become expert in, in anything, and we believe that using, using a simulator as in all other sorts of, of human <coughs> things that people do, you can train the people uh, much faster. Because they don't have to wait until the rock slides through the ice. You can expose them to different situations from different games that they would actually have to play many, many games to, to get to these interesting situations because most situations are just straightforward and if you use a simulator and you, you let them play there, then, then you, you can improve this, this uh, training process. Then for a particular situation, you can, you can ask the AI what is a good shot to do. Because we know that our AI currently in some, some shots, but in general, uh, will be better than people. We hope that it will suggest shots that maybe people wouldn't think, think about. And furthermore, it can analyze shots that, that it engages. So it can give you some information why it thinks that it's a, it's a good shot. So, so for this shot, it looks that it might be quite fragile, but it's actually very, very robust. And if these are different executions, how, how it could, could end up if you attempt the shot with some noise, that, that is very, very common in, in the game. You can see that, okay, this rock will always go, go that way. This rock will most, most of the time go this way, but sometimes it will go here. This will usually stay at, at, the, at the place, but probably move a little. So you can give much more insight into, into what's going on with alternative shots. Is that an argument for your simulator? Yeah. But is that an argument also for having a score function? Uh, for having score function, yes, because like you, you can explain why the shot is good at this particular point, but it's harder to explain like what will go go on after two or three other shots that you are getting to a state which is kind of strange. But still, like thanks to our, our, our tools, we, we should be able to do that. So that was the application perspective. Now we are coming to the AI research perspective. So why do we care as, as AI researchers? So, you probably all know that this department likes to solve games. So there are different AI challenges and we think that this is particularly interesting challenge. Because if we think about the last challenge game of Go, it was a challenge because it, it has a huge state space, right? But curling it has infinite state space. You can put each rock at any position in the continuous space and really if you shift it just, just an inch somewhere, it, it may have strategic uh, uh, consequences. Another thing is branching factor, like Go has large branching factor, but again we have infinite branching factor. We can set any angle we want to throw the rock at, we can set any speed, and again this is a novel challenge that is not common in the, in the games that people uh, usually solve. And the last part is execution. Like when you are trying to put the piece on the, on the Go board, you usually make it. Like if it doesn't happen that you would put it like three squares away. But in, in uh, curling, it always happens. Like, even the best <laughs> Olympic curlers, then, then they never, never actually make the shot they want. They make shot very, which is very close. But on like worse level, it gets further and further. And there was a similar game analyzed before, which is billiards. And we think that that curling is even better than billiards because it's kind of smaller. We have just these two continuous variables to define the action, while in billiards they had six because they were looking at like where exactly you hit the hit the ball, what spin you give it, and so on. So it was more more complex than that. But more importantly, it, it is a much less strategic game because when you are playing billiards, you are playing in a way that the opponent never gets to move. So you don't really have to think about the adversarial interaction. You are, you are just trying to pocket all your balls before the opponent moves. And here the players alternate. So. You really have to think about when I do this, what the opponent does. So that's why we think that is a really interesting AI test. So what do we have so far? So so far we have a physics simulator. <coughs> physics simulator is uh, based on some principal mechanisms uh, for for the collisions and for friction and so on. And 
it gets a current state on the ISO positions of, of all the stones, and it gets the action. And the action is characterized by the aim, the angle, under which we want to want to throw, the weight, the strength, how we want to want to throw it, and the rotation, the spin, if we want to rotate it one way or the other way. Usually it's a binary variable because the, the corollers don't really try different rotations. They have one rotation frame and they are trying to be consistent in, in, in that, that rotation. Uh, and then the output of the simulator is that, okay, the rock will go this way, this way, we'll bump this a little down, and then the red one will stay here, so the output state will look like this. So that's what we have already. You usually have those humans with these two drones. Yes, that's the second part, and that's the noise model, the execution model. So we believe that the main, uh, of course there are other, other reasons why people sweep, but the main reason to sweep is because the person who was shooting, they made a mistake. Like if they were able to always show exactly the, the right speed and the right angle, then there would be much less need for sweeping. So we include the sweeping in the execution model. Disagree with that statement. <laughs> of course, it's a simplification. Some shots, people uh, take the broom into effect, and you can make it, and you could never make it without the broom. Uh, yes, like it is, it is certain simplification, but that's, that's where we start to, to keep the parameters of, of the yeah. of the shot simpler. But that we but you're right. The main reason the main to reason is to correct, correct for for the for the. <laughs> so we have an execution model which is uh, uh, calibrated based on. Uh, data we have from, from Olympic Olympics so that it per performs in the current percentage similar way as, as people and you just give it the intended shots and it perturbs the, the aim, weight, turn, usually doesn't change and it can give you the alternate alternative shots like what could happen if you actually attempted this shot. So that's also a part that, that is already built. Next thing we have and we are working on is rock position tracking system so in, in our, yeah Chavo? So regarding the simulator, do you have any validation of it? Like, do you know how precise it is? Did you try to quantify that? Uh, kind of. Uh, okay. But we don't really, I don't know the number. Okay. It's okay. Like, it, it's you hard. It's reasonably accurate. Yeah, it's reasonably accurate. When you look at it, it like, it's, it behaves as, like, no crawler has said that this behaves very strangely. Feel but of course, like it's not 100%. We, we couldn't really calibrate it to, to have all, everything I mean, exactly as There is noise, maybe inherent noise. In the there, there is inherent noise, of course, because on the ice you can have some dirt or something which, which will change things in a very different way than you would expect. So, so that's why we have heavy tails on the noise, but we couldn't really calibrate the heavy tails very much. But so like, did you actually try to? Get some numbers so there. Yeah, like we, we, we really tried, we, we did the calibration <laughs> right. We, we got the Olympic, numbers, Olympic data, we, we took the shots, like different kinds of shots right. and, and their curling percentage. We created a system that, that makes the similar curling percentage values as, as human do. And then we were trying to calibrate the parameters of the noise so that they match the, the human, pers <laughs> human uh, curling percentages of the same shots. On and you're sort of happy with it. And we are okay. sort of happy with like, it. There is always room for, for improvements, sure. but, but we spend a lot of time and we are kind of happy with it. Right. So the last thing is rock position tracking. So in order to be able to calibrate better and do everything better, uh, we took uh, Raspberry Pi computers with cameras, we mounted them in, in our uh, curling hole, and uh, like it's still in progress, but we are able to, to get the pictures that it's producing and identify the rocks. And, get this position on the ice in a precision which was never seen before because so far nobody does that even though it's a very simple machine, machine vision problem everybody is just putting the rocks like by tapping on, a, on an iPad. Is there a, a degradation in the quality of the ice over the course of a game or does it does it maintain a certain it's, personal level? I wouldn't say it's degradation, it's changing. <laughs> like Yes, it is changing. And do you model that? We don't the model friction. that right now. Now, right now we have, in the friction and so on, we have uh, more like uniform, uniform ice. And again, sweeping is something that tries to correct for it. Like right. if some, some patch of ice is, is like slowing down it's more than other, then, then you try to sweep more so that it doesn't happen. Chaba? So feel free not to answer it if you don't have time, but 
back to calibration. So yeah. how do you know which angle the humans were aiming for and what the weight was? Because if you want to have a predictive model, you have to know that. Yes, uh, so we, we have some, some shots like we know when they are trying to draw the button, for example, because there is uh, some tie-breaking rule is based on that everybody is just trying to, to draw the button. So we know that everybody is trying to be as close to the center as possible. Okay. So that's one, one type of the shot that we know that what they wanted, like what, what it's angle. It's exactly the same thing as the input to the simulator. It is, the because that there, is, there is a unique angle and, and weight for the simulator you need so that the run stops exactly in the middle of that. Yes. And now you know that when they try to do that, they sometimes end up here and sometimes end up here. And, and that's that's the noise given by humans, and then you can calibrate it to, to, to match them. So since, uh, may I say something? Yep, sure. So since you are already uh, kind of building the system to, to track the game, would it make sense to instrument the like stick or whatever like that? Yep. Right? To, to get the weight information and angle information and like all of that? Yes, that, that's also something we are, we are working on that okay. we would like to put a, put a re reflective sticker on the on the broom so that we know right. where they are in yeah that, that's yes. that's a good idea. Yes. So the camera is not dead center with the home. Why is that? I mean, is that this, this is after some some uh, transformations. Oh, this okay. is not, not the, the direct image that's from the, the real camera. One. Yeah. The, the real image is like we wanted more resolution in the house because we yeah. we think that is more important than than the resolution in, in the guards. Yeah, but the, currently that angle is not. A, no, like currently this, this is already transformed image. Like it's it has all co kind of kinds of distortions and perspective and, and, and everything, and this is after yeah. correcting for for all of that. Okay, we should probably go on. If we want to get some some technical part, mm -hmm. some technical part. So of course, what we are most interested in are the AI algorithms, so we have a set of AI algorithms that, that are able to, sh to choose uh, shots for for specific position, and uh, uh, Zane and Tim will talk more about them afterwards. And we have a graphical user interface that combines it all, so you can get a log of, of your, your game, you can load it to, to that, you can analyze shots, you can create what if scenarios, so you can create branches in the, in, in the log, and you can ask, like, if I play this shot, Show differently what would happen, what would the AI suggest for that, and so on. But I will not show the demo. Winning percentage? Uh, it produces like like the the WP, graph the graph I showed at the at the beginning with with, with percentages. It starts with WP winning percentage. Yeah, yes. okay. WP is winning percentage. So so for winning percentage, we just just run the AI against it so many many times from nice. from the position, and that's also produced by the system. So that's probably. It or from the introduction, and we can we can go to the more technical parts. Right. So I actually worked on one particular problem in this curling uh, in the curling domain. So as Billy mentioned before, that we have noise, we have an infinite branching factor, we have an infinite number of actions, and so I decided to keep things simple that I'm going to work on the tree from the bottom up. So I'm looking at the leaves of the tree. So if the tree, if a tree represents the play throughout an end of curling, the leaves of the tree are the hammer shots. And I focus on the hammer shots. That way I only look at one objective function that I just have to find the best shot from. So I'll be optimizing and evaluation function. So, if we could take every shot perfectly, then for a typical form of the function would look something like this. So we have our angle over here. So the angle that we take, which goes from minus 0 0.06 radians to 0 0.06 radians. We have velocity, which is measured in uh, millimeters per second. So note that it goes from low to high, up to down. And these are, the, the colors represent the points that that shot got at that particular state. Now, the state we'll see, which state this is, we'll see in a bit, but, so we see that the darker the, uh, the, the reddish color is, the higher you score. So down over here in this heat map, we have pretty much a draw weight, or that's the draw to the button that scores us one point. And our function over here, without the noise, it's very 
discretize, well, it's not discretize, it's a step function. But if we have noisy functions where we, that, where we take a shot, and then we run it through our execution model and we get a noisy shot, that means it's perturbed from what we actually want. We actually execute the perturbed shot in our physics simulator and we get the result for that. To evaluate how our function looks with noise, we take a bunch of shots for at each parameter that we intend to, uh, at each shot that we intend to take, we repeat that shot many times given the noise, and we get an estimate of the expected value of that shot. Now these are all points in this case. We can also use win percentage, but right now we're using the expected points that is received by that shot, and we see that this function form now became a little blurrier and smoother. Yes. How does a shot lose you three points? Well, let's say there's already on the ice, uh, in the house, the, opponent, the opposing team had three rocks, and we just shot somewhere. Uh -huh. Right now, we can lose three points out. Okay, sure. So now our, uh, our object, my objective is to optimize this function, and to find a shot that is not only, that not only scores well for us, but also is robust to noise. That means we don't have to be super precise in order to get that shot. So we looked at different approaches for optimization. So one approach we looked at is modeling as a band problem using the hierarchical optimistic optimization. I'm not going to be going through the details of all the algorithms that we looked at because of we are lacking in time, but in hierarchical op optimistic optimization, or who, we just model the space environment as a set of arms, and we pull an arm in this area, and we get a, we get a reward. Now, who <coughs> expands, uh, who tries to cover the space using cover trees? So each node represents a particular space in that environment, or the set in that environment, and as we get further down the tree, these the, the, the sets are smaller and smaller, and we get a tree structure that looks something like this. So, one node, the root node, covers the whole environment. The bottom, uh, the nodes, the children of that root node covers half of the environment, and so on, it gets smaller that way. So we keep expanding trees according to the rules of who, and we tend to find a point that's well. So if we have a function that looks something like this, the tree that is expanded by who looks like that or a typical tree expanded by who looks like that. Gaussian process optimization, uh, I don't want to explain it right now because it will take too long and it will probably cause or create more questions than answer them in the time that I'm given, but Gaussian process optimization is another type of optimization technique that we use to try to find a good hammer shot. And we also have particle swarm optimization, which is created trying to model flight of birds or the flocking of birds. So we take samples in our space and we find the personal best of each particle or each point that we sampled and we mark the global best that we found so far and all the particles tend to be drawn towards the global best. And hopefully by doing that over a number of iterations we find to a we converge to a local optimum or if we finish early, whatever is the best point at that time, we just take that. Now we're looking at a different kind of algorithm. The algorithm that we're using is, we're calling it Delaunay sampling because we can't have, well, I didn't come up with a better name for it yet. So Delaunay sampling is actually based on the Delaunay triangulation, which is a method that is used to uh, map the topology of terrains. And we decided to adopt that for function approximation. So what we do in Delaunay sampling is that we take samples uniformly in the area. We do it uniformly, you can initially sample it however you like. So after we take a uniform sampling in the area, we create a Delaunay triangulation, uh, which creates a triangular mesh in the environment. Now after we create that mesh, what we do is that to each triangle in that mesh, or to each simplex in that mesh, we give it a weight. The weight of this mesh depends upon the maximum of the point we're looking at. The, we'll look at that in a bit. So after we give it a weight, we sample from the mesh, or sample triangles in this mesh uh, with replacement. And every time we sample a triangle, we decide to take 
another sample in that lid. So after we sample a bunch of triangles, we then take samples, or after we pick triangles from that uh, the mesh, we take samples in those triangles, and we create another mesh, and we keep doing this. And that sort of brings us to get our sampling to converge to a good solution. So the weight function, that means after we create our mesh, the weight that we give it depends on the area of the triangle that we choose, uh, that we have, and the score. Now the score is not the actual score of that triangle, but we look at each vertex of the triangle, the volume observed by each vertex, we choose a maximum, and we use that as our score for the triangle. So we'll have a very optimistic or optimistic uh, weight function which looks at the best points or which gives uh, a higher estimate of the volume of the triangle. After we do a round of, or after we do several rounds of the Delaunay triangulation and sampling, we need to find the shot that we want to use. So, in this case, we choose the best triangle to sample from using UCB. We run UCB to improve our knowledge or the estimate of the volume of each triangle using a different weight function. The weight function in this case is using the mean because the mean is more representative of the true volume of the triangle rather than the max. So after we run UCB for a number of times, we choose the triangle with whatever selection policy you want. And we went with choosing the triangle or the simplex that has been selected the most by UCB. Yes? UCB requires a confidence interval. How do you set it? Um, could you repeat that question, please? UCB requires a confidence interval. Okay. How do you compute that? Um, well, that could vary, but we could talk about this afterward. I just want to get through this. Okay. Right now. So after we have, uh, so that's how the algorithm works. And well, let's look at a few examples of the shots chosen by the algorithm. So this is a pretty easy state, hammer shot, uh, and yellow is shooting. So if we had this state, what would be like? Could anyone take a guess at what shot you want to take? Well, we simply draw to the button if you were yellow. So. Uh, that's what actually the long sampling does. It finds a shot that is to be drawn to the button. This is the function form that it's trying to optimize for that state. And the long triangulation takes all of its samples in. Uh, so the long triangulation focuses most of its samples in the darker region when we score a point. So, is there another answer to just hit the other yellow rock? It is possible. There'll be another option. There'll be a, but you can't get. So what's what's advantageous about the, about the? So right, that's a good question because if we look at this form, the black area in this region in this space represents shots that will give us a point. So a draw to the put button would be around here. Taking out or hitting that would be somewhere around this area or down here. So we can see that the air region for drawing to the button is larger than the region for hitting the other rock end. Maybe not as robust. It's not as robust to noise. You have to be more precise. I missed the argument why you chose the Delaunay triangulation instead of PSO. Why did you drop PSO? We didn't drop PSO. We're evaluating against that. We're actually looking at it. PSO. So you will do it and then yeah. you compare at the end? Yeah. Okay. So those are all the techniques that we looked at. Okay. Good. What's the difference from this and who, where you partition the space and you're going to focus on that region of the This is a more heuristic approach. So it actually looks at better reasons instead of having where who tries to balance exploitation and exploration. Most better algorithms. This one just takes a heuristic approach and says, oh, this one looks good. I'm going to look there. I'm going to look there. I'm going to look there. It doesn't decide to explore more explicitly. I have a similar question. As far as I have only seen who for single variables. Is there a version for multiple variables? Yes. Yeah. Or there is? Well, well, we implemented it for multiple variables, yeah. So you can actually implement it in multiple Then you get like rectangles? So. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. You get rectangles and you keep dividing. Well, actually, uh, what Wu says is that you can uh, partition the space in any number of ways, as long as the regions don't get like really, you know, like long and mm -hmm. narrow and something like that, it's going to burn. So and how about, mm -hmm. should burn. How about the triangles? Can they get like really long and thin? Yes, you can get triangles that get really long. And you'll see the effects of that in a bit. Um, so, this is where Delaunay sampling took most of its samples around this region. This is the other areas where we'll be uniform sample. Here's some few points <coughs> where it explores. And for when we chose a bunch of shots to explore further, it chose them all in that black region. Or it said that most of the good shots that we want to explore are drawn to the butt. So it just ignored taking the, or, hit, or raising the one in to the that you were talking about. So here's another state. This time red is shooting. In this case, it's a little tougher. But the long triangle uh, triangulation decided to hit the yellow rock in the center and then roll off of it, scroll the ball. This is the terrain that we have, and it's a little more complex than the previous one. And Delaunay sampling chose to sample in these areas. We have these stripes. Now, that is what we believe is or a repercussion of the elongated triangles and everything, but we're examining it further. But after it sampled, it chose a bunch of points, and these are all the points that it decided to look at to choose a shot. Uh, another example, it's even harder, yellow is shooting. In the long sample, decided to do a weird shot where it hit this rock and take out a whole bunch of other red rocks to keep the yellow rock in. This is a very hard function to optimize because we have very small areas in which we can actually score anything, and the rest is just losing points. The long sampling focus on this region, and all of its candidates for UCB are in that little black spot. So we have at no point did you think about robustness issues, or, or is that what well, it is? Right. I, thank you. I forgot to mention that that all of, all all of what we're learning is using noisy. Noisy, uh, noisy sure. execution, okay. but our the, the, I'm just displacing the noise free okay. version. So you were in fact looking at yes. the shot here, Mike. So these are all robust shots. Got it. Okay. So we have results where we experimented against humans. We gave Delaunay sampling set of budgets, and then we found the school, the average performance of Delaunay sampling over a set of states from the Olympic Games. Uh, we optimize using the win percentage because we feel that more reflects how humans try to optimize their performance. And we found that we do tend to beat humans after around, with all the budgets that we use, we it perform better than humans, but statistically significant, uh, these are all the statistical p-values we got from the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And beyond a thousand, we get but significant something. Good job. That's um, awesome. So, then, hang on, just get me. And then we examined <laughs> the performance of who against, uh, the line sampling against who, PSOs and GPOs, and we found that the line sampling does perform better than the other algorithms. <laughs> and these differences are all statistically significant. I didn't fix the volumes. And yeah, so. Yes. So does it matter what end you're playing? We're only looking at hammer shots and hammer we're looking at over all the ends of the hammer shots. So how do you decide which so you're saying that the hammer shot you take for the first end and the tenth end would be the same? Well and have the score involved as well? We don't look we're not looking at the score, but since we're using the win percentage. So when we're looking at the win percentage, it's more, we can actually consider that the way the long sample before, uh, looks to optimize is similar to humans still. So we're, just, we're including all of the first end and second and third end. Yeah, the difference is in win percentage. If, if you are losing by two at the very beginning, then, then you okay. care less than if you are in the very last land and, and you are losing by two, actually anything that is good for you is 
getting at least two. Right. So, so that's a function that you optimize is different. So so you model that's, for that's why the ends are different. You have a model for the whole game, how much you had up behind and which end you are. Yeah. And that's part of yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Like we, we have a mark table okay. that is pre computed from human data, like yeah. how likely it is to win if you are down by two and you have two ends to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my part. So while Zaheen was looking at uh, camera shots, I looked more at putting um, our computer curling in the whole game search. So looking at how we can use Monte Carlo research to look at the entire end as opposed to just the hammer shot. So um, as a quick review of Monte Carlo research, um, Monte Carlo research is an algorithm um, to explore a game tree uh, or it iteratively, iteratively builds up a game tree while trying to approximate the um, win percentage or expected values of the states that it's exploring. Uh, for example, here we have a two-player game where white is one player and gray is the second <coughs> player and the numbers inside are um, the win percentages. So. Uh, at the root node, we have it's 111 games out of 21 times it's tried to play out a game um, throughout its search. Um, Monte Carlo tree search itself is made up of these four stages selection, where at each node it tries to decide what it thinks is the optimal action. So here at the root, it saw that this action, which led to what it's seen, is a 7 tenths uh, chance of winning and follows it down until it reaches a node where it sees an action that it hasn't previously seen and moves into the expansion phase where it adds that action to the tree. From there, um, that new action, it does a simulation out to the end of the end or the game or uses some heuristic to estimate what it thinks the value of that new action or state is. And then finally, with that evaluation backs it up through the actions you've seen in that tree. Um, so the question is, can we now use Monte Carlo tree search and apply it to curling? Well, we run into a problem here at selection um, in that, uh, well, for one, we have a continuous action space. Uh, Monte Carlo tree search tries to evaluate each of its actions once before trying to go deeper. So with a continuous action space, we'd actually never get deeper than just this first level if we try doing the normal Monte Carlo tree search method. So uh, the way around that is a method called progressive widening, where we'll never consider more than um, the square root of number of visits actions uh, before we add another action. Um, I have a small animation to demonstrate this, so, or, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, the animation is not on a PDF. Um, so here we have one visit, and then on the second time it chooses an action, it will try a second action because it's now uh, looking at its square root of two, so it can go up to two actions. So on its next visit, it'll retry one of those two visits as opposed to adding a third action, and so on down the tree as it as its newer nodes. Uh, yeah, that's, so, um, yeah, you can note that if we had another action, we'd have a fourth action from the roots, but here, um, we're just going to stop at night. Uh, one thing to note is you may see that this has five visits, but it only has two uh, actions and that because one of those visits was when it was initially added to the tree uh, during the expansion stage. So it only got to choose an action four times, so the one and three. So on the next time we would visit here, we'd add another action. Um, so we've dealt with the continuous action space that William talked about, but we also have the continuous outcome space, which is what William was talking about uh, earlier. 
where instead of actually choosing which action to take to get to the next game state, we choose an action and then it goes to a um, random eight, or an agent that kind of acts in some random manner um, based off the action we've chosen, represented here by these square blocks. So we would like choose this action and then it gets modified in some way under our noise model and we end up at some new states. Um, again, this outcome space is infinite and we would use progressive lighting again under these uh, random, uh, random nodes to expand based on the number of minutes we have to that, um, that random uh, node. So if we visited this four times, we'd only have two, and then nine, we'd have three. Um, so we might think we've con uh, dealt with continuous actions and outcomes in here. So we should be able to use uh, Monte Carlo's research using just those progressive widening. Uh, however, we think that we could take advantage more in that because the way our execution um, model works is that we choose an action, but then it can lead to the same set of uh, outcome spaces instead of, as we saw here, we kind of have two uh, separate outcome spaces under each random node, but in fact we can actually model it as this, where each random uh, no, it can lead to the same set of outcomes. So, like, I may be trying to the button and end up going like five uh, millimeters per second faster, but I could have also done that too by just directly trying to make that shot and having very little noise itself. So, so you're not discretizing? Uh, I, mean, what? I, I thought it was infinite set of positions with, for each of the rocks. Are yes. you not discretizing it now? I thought earlier. <coughs> Uh, so sorry. how could it be the same? I thought I thought every different position would yes. be a different position unless you're discretizing it. Yes, you're but not. you can arrive to that state through um, through this, this is not not how the tree will look like. Yes, it's just the intuition that yes, you can get to the yes. same positions, but in practice you would yes. never actually. So you can get to this state by going through this way or but this way. Different precisions. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So the intuition is, yes, we can get to the state by following the tree this direction and this direction, yeah. but under the previous model, we would have had this as a separate state oh, in two different branches. Yeah. So the intuition is, can we actually now use that information and share it so that we can inform uh, multiple branches as opposed to just the one through the backup? Yes. I guess the question is, what are those states? Are they like regions or are they really single states? They're single states, <laughs> precise, like wrong positions. But then there's like probability zero, zero. ever hitting it again, right? Yes. Unless you're desperate. We're gone. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but also note that down here they are two separate states because this state may have removed a rock from play, whereas this one didn't, so we can't actually do that further down the tree besides just one. So, um, in normal MCTS, we use UCT, uh, the equation over here, to decide which direction to go down uh, the tree when choosing actions. And it's based off of some estimate of the value, uh, most in this case, V bar, which is the percentage based off the previous visits, and plus some expiration confidence down based off of the number of visits to that uh, action or state. So the question is, how do we get the notion of uh, this estimate of an action and the number of visits if we're starting to try and share information between uh, rollouts? Um, and the answer that we've used is kernel regression, where we're using um, a locally weighted estimator to approximate the value of that action based off of uh, data points we may have seen that are close to close by that point that we're trying to approximate. So here in this image, we're trying to approximate here, and we use this kernel, which is the yellow weighting, to weight the points around it so that we actually have seen to get a good estimate of uh, where on this function at that x value it might be. Uh, in our case, our kernel is the student t distribution from our execution error. One from convenience, but two would also um, 
helps us weight properly the likelihood of taking a certain action arriving at a certain state when we want to consider a certain action. Uh, we'll be using the Nadaraya Watson uh, regressor, which is just simply a uh, weighted sum divided by the normalization of our kernel. Uh, note also we do have the v-bar here from the rollouts that we've stored, so we do still store the rollouts in a specific <laughs> node and use it here for uh, our estimate of points. So we have our replacement for uh, v-bar. The question is how do we now uh, approximate the number of visits because we're actually now sharing information and we're simply going to just do uh, a sum Oh, using the kernel again, weighting the, num the, just the number of visits to those points. And we can kind of see it down here. That kind of makes sense in that um, if we have samples far away, the kernel that we're using will be very close to zero, so it's not like we're adding any information to that estimate. But the ones close by will have a higher weight. And if we have many of them nearby, then this value will increase approximately linearly like it would if we were visiting that action multiple times throughout Monte Carlo Tree Search. And it might seem weird that we're having ends that might be fractional or really large or really small, but uh, we can adjust for that in the C, which is a domain specific constant that we tune um, using uh, in our experiments. So fully written out, this is a comparison where we have this representing our VR and these two sums are our um, So the question now is how does this compare to other algorithm other algorithms that um, we've talked about? So we are our algorithm compare UCT, we've compared to normal UCT, uh, the progressive widening we talked about, and Rave, which is another um, technique used uh, trying to do information sharing as well. So we'll have, we have RAVE and then RAVE plus progressive widening. Uh, all of these algorithms do have some domain knowledge to help it sort, um, help it sort um, actions to first consider ones that <coughs> humans deem good, which are ones that are keep rocks in, the, in play or remove opponent rocks just so it gives it a fair shot at actually finding decent shots and not just throwing rocks willy-nilly all over. Um, and we have the expected, the numbers in this are the expected points for uh, the row algorithm versus the problem. In a one-end game where, uh, where we, alt we gave an equal number of games where the bots had the last shot uh, because it is advantageous to have last shot because you get to um, either correct for or gain points uh, based off the first 15 shots. Um, and we see that um, the numbers in bold are uh, statistically significant in a um, binomial comparison or binomial test. So we have to see if statistical significance our algorithm does outperform the other uh, four algorithms. In terms of any percentage? Uh, this is expected points. So, uh, yes. So uh, for any given end where we don't know whether or not it has him or not, kernel regression UCT will beat uh, normal UCT by about uh, 900 zero points on expectation. Uh, furthermore, uh, we did, I did a variation of a hammer um, hammer shot test in which I took the logs from the previous round robin and uh, just looked at the hammer shots generated by those uh, games and passed them to each algorithm. So on the right are the right represents the states generated by that algorithm when it had the hammer shot, so games which it had the hammer shot in the previous experiment, and then we pass that to each of the five algorithms and let them choose a hammer shot from that game state. And the numbers here are expected points from those game states on average. Um, 
And then fold over here is uh, significance in a two, um, or sorry, in a paired t test. So we see that kernel regression, if we compare columns, we see kernel regression outperforms all other algorithms, regardless of how good or bad of a state we may be in based off of that bias of getting to that hammer state. Uh, we didn't see any statistical significance between uh, states itself if we compare rows, but it kind of looks like grave plus progressive widening might have a slight edge, but there's no statistical significance there uh, based off of the data we collected. Um, so our future work for that is to actually look at what happens if we add RAVE to kernel regression UCT since we saw there was a boost uh, between uh, when we added RAVE to progressive widening and we wonder if we get the same with kernel regression UCT. And then also to start looking at full games and seeing if that 0 .9, uh, 0.09 expected points against UCT actually translates into a win in terms of significance uh, in a full 10 end game. That's it. We have time for questions? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to build a robot to actually do the curl on the rocks? No. Yeah. Not at this point. You know, like, we don't mind people executing the shots, so we can just tell them what to do. And, and they're going to do they're, they're quite good robots. So. Okay, I'm theory. I'm. Any other questions? Yeah, <clears throat> this is maybe a question that shows I don't fully understand what your overall objective is. But <clears throat> when you play curling a lot, uh, there are certain things you learn reasonably quickly. And uh, so that you might call these heuristics. Uh, and that is to control the center line and, and, and things like that. Uh, I didn't see any of that in, in what you're doing. Is, is this something that you, you basically your simulations are set up so that you'll learn that over time? Is that what Yes, that, that's the point. Uh, because these heuristics are often wrong. Like there is one, one thing people do and that's blanking the first amp, if you know what it means. So our system says, based on all the data we can get, that it's not a good idea. That you are actually losing like 3% of win percentage if you do that. If you, so for, for again, you're talking Yeah, talk, like you're for people who don't know curling, there is one. You're talking about Olympic level curling. Yes. Because you don't have them. Yeah. For ordinary. Uh, the hammer is important thing, like who, Place the last last rock is, is very important, and uh, the rules say that in the next end the hammer belongs to the player that <coughs> lost the or that didn't score in the previous previous end. So yeah. there is some strategic decision in if we want to rather score one point <coughs> and the opponent will have, have hammer afterwards, or we score zero points and then we can keep the hammer and, and we'll hammer in the next round as well. And uh, in this decision. It looks like the human heuristic is not consistent with data. When people don't do that, they often more often. They, they win more often. So, so that's the reason why we are trying to, to include as little heuristic as possible. And if we include some heuristic, it's just to guide the search, so to, to start at, at good places. But we always want the system to be able to go away from, from the heuristic and, and find something better in it. In it. Are you like trying to learn an evaluation function eventually, like people did in Go eventually? Yeah, that would be that is a potential project for the future. Yes, like we tried that. We didn't try that with deep learning or anything strong. We just tried uh, logistic regression, and it seems to help a lot. That's like all the other things like Rave and and, and uh, progressive widening on that or actions within the. The generated reactions and so on gave us like a percent, two percent in the human percentage over, over the whole game. This, even with the logistic regression, seems to give us five percent. So we think that if we were able to do that right, that we get a, a big win from, from learning the evaluation function. And that's also one of the reasons why we are setting up the, the cameras to settle, to, to have more data to be able to learn more. Because 
The only data we actually have with rock positions are two Olympic Games, so it's like 200 games. And uh, they are imprecise because they were put down by, by finger and sometimes they are not even consistent with the score. So that's why we hope we will have quite fair day. If a, if a human plays the simulator at one play and the AI plays the other one, yep. does the AI win? With me, yes. <laughs> but my yeah, good. Oh. It's hard to say because it has a lot of noise, so we would have to play really a lot of games to get yeah, yeah, sure. significant results. But Mike thinks that he's tied. I think I'm losing, so it's, it's rather strong. And we, we didn't do a proper significant test for him. Okay, there are no other questions. Thank you very much.